All right, this lab was heating and cooling ingredients using the heater cooler. We had two different heater cooler units. We used the old Terumo hemotherm that's still being used in practice. That's about 40 years old, but it's kind of a workhorse and they don't fail, and so people like those. The difference between that heater cooler and the Alpha Omega unit is the number of channels that uh, you can run at the same time. The Alpha Omega unit is a dual channel heater cooler. That means you can run two different temperatures at the same time. That's important for us because we are allowed then to use one channel for the patient to maintain patient temperature, but at the same time we can cool our cardioplegia down and arrest the heart and maintain the metabolism of the heart. So it's important to know that you have uh, two different or three different types of heater coolers and the way the, the functionality of that heater cooler works. Is it a heater cooler that you have to add ice to? Is it a heater cooler that you don't need ice with, that forms its own ice block? You have to know the internal workings of the way those heater coolers work. Is, is there a centrifugal pump on the inside? Does that heater cooler run water over the heating elements? And is that separate than a heater cooler that goes through the ice bath? So you need to, you kind of need to know and plan for how a heater cooler uh, that you're using works. Heating and cooling a patient is one of the most important things that we do even though it's a small ancillary part of uh, the bypass run or perfusion in general, it's very, very important. The reason it's so important is because we can cause major harm if we don't do this the appropriate way. So we're gonna go over a few of those different options and the different ways that we can potentially cause harm. And we can, uh, we can under, hopefully at the end of this, you can understand why this is so important. So the first thing, you have to understand your setup. You have to be prepared. Generally, we don't have many problems with heating and cooling our patients if we are prepared. What's that mean? Knowing the heater cooler, knowing the size of your patient, knowing the gender of your patient, knowing the volume status of our patient because all of these things have an impact on heating and cooling. Knowing the heater cooler you're gonna use, knowing that you have ice available, checking your heater cooler lines and things like that to make sure that they're free of contamination or bacteria. Check the, check the functionality of the oxygenator in the system, the integrity. Do you water test your oxygenator first? Do you gas test your oxygenator first? Do you, have you turned your heater cooler on and run it through a cycle or two before you prime your system? Checking those things prior to when you get your patient in and you have your patient hooked up generally makes it so your heater cooler is gonna have proper functionality. We've touched on a little bit about what, uh, blood to water leaks, water to blood leaks. I've shared with you guys a story about me when I once had an oxygenator that had a blood to water leak where I saw my, my water lines start to get a little rose colored. It was, a, it was an aortic valve, very quick case where uh, there was a slight water to, uh, blood to water leak. Fortunately, the first thing I did was I turned my heater cooler off because I wasn't gonna cool the patient. That made sure that the pressure gradient stayed blood to water as opposed to water to blood where it would contaminate my, my blood. So that was important. And then we, uh, I called my partners in and we uh, talked through whether we should change our oxygenator out or whether we should roll with it and give some antibiotics and things like that. We ended up rolling with it. We kept it, kept it as a blood to water leak. That's the only time in my career of over 3,000 hearts where I saw any kind of water to blood or blood to water leak. So it doesn't happen all that often, but it does have the potential to happen. So first thing I wanna to touch on, this is probably the most important part of this lab and what we saw. This lab, we were going through a system, but we were ultimately heating and cooling a bucket, a bucket of water, that was our patient. That's very different fundamentally than cooling or heating a patient, correct? Our patient's gonna be way different in its vasculature, in its amount of fluid, in all those different types of things, then a bucket's gonna be. Just like every lab that we do, whether it's siphon drainage, whether it's heating and cooling, whether it's when we're going on and off bypass, what we're gonna see with the bucket is fundamentally different than what we're gonna see with the patient. But we can still maintain these proper gradients in this lab that are imperative that we do during surgery, during bypass surgery. The first one I want to talk about is the temperature gradient anywhere in our system where two components come together, we want to maintain no greater than, we'll say a seven to 10 degree difference. What, what it was when I went through school and what it was 30 and 40 years ago was a 10 degree difference. You'd see, you would see 10 to 12 degree temperature gradient. Now, 
that's what may likely be on your board exam in a year and a half from now when you sit for the board exam. It may be still a 10 degree gradient, but all of the new research that's come out shows maybe that's as low as a seven degree difference anywhere in two areas. So you don't wanna see a greater than seven degree temperature gradient between any two areas where the blood or water comes into indirect contact with each other. And you can think of that, whether that's in the patient, in the capillaries, whether that's in your arterial or your venous blood, whether that's in your oxygenator, you don't wanna go, for our nets and purposes, we're gonna say a seven to 10 degree gradient. That's what we're gonna go with. That's one part of it. The other part of it is how quickly or how slowly do we need to heat or cool our patients? We don't want to exceed, mark this down, make this a note, remember this for your board exam too. We don't want to exceed any higher than one degree every three minutes. We don't want to cool any more rapidly, we don't want to warm any more rapidly than one degree every three minutes. That means if we're going 10 degrees, if we're going from 37 degrees to 27 degrees, that should take us a minimum amount of time of 30 minutes, a half an hour. If we're going 20 degrees, that should take us an hour. So theoretically, if we're gonna circa rest a patient and they are at normal thermia, 37 degrees, and we're shooting for 16 to 18 degrees, everybody in the room, surgeon included, perfusionist included, we have to be on the, pa on the same page that that needs to take us a minimum of one hour to heat or cool that patient. Now, in the grand terms of surgery time, that's gonna seem like six hours. An hour is gonna take forever. There may be a time when everybody drink, uh, breaks scrub and they go and have lunch or go to the restroom or whatever it is, and you're there on pump making sure that that patient is heated and cooled at that appropriate rate. If we don't, if we cool or heat faster than that, we put that patient at risk for neurologic injury. We put that patient at risk for stroke. We put that patient at risk for bleeding uh, disorders, coagulopathies, during or after the procedure. So we need to, need to be cognizant of the fact that if we don't follow those temperature gradients or the speed at which we warm and cool our patients, we put our patients at risk. Now, there's a lot of things that go into that. What happens to the patient during that time? Because we're sitting back behind the pump and we're thinking, we're watching numbers, essentially. We're dialing in our heater cooler. Again, the difference between these heater coolers, the old Trumo heater, heater uh, cooler, we have about five different temperatures. We have very cold, we have cold, we have kind of room temperature, we have slightly warm and very warm. Whereas the Alpha Omega, the, the Soren uh, 3T, the different uh, heater coolers on the market, they allow you to digitally dial in a specific temperature that you want. It allows you to fine tune control. So we're dialing that in, we're watching the numbers, we're watching our gradients and things like that. But we gotta be thinking, what's happening in the patient? What's the patient telling us? As we cool, what do we wanna do with our sweep rate and our FiO2? Decrease.